Hi, thanks for joining us on Basketball Australia's Building Better Basketball podcast series. And today I'm joined by Ellie Manu. Fans of the WNBL will no doubt remember Ellie from uh, playing with a, a few teams in the league, uh, but now she's the head of basketball at Knox School in Sydney. And we've also got Toby Conroy, who's one of the physiotherapists with Momentum Sports and Rehabilitation. Uh, he's a physio with the under-19 Australian men's basketball team and also does a, a heck of a lot of work with the ACT uh, representative basketball team. So, Ellie and Toby, thanks very much for joining me on the t- podcast. No worries. Thanks for having me. Um, what we're talking about today is a safe return to sport. Uh, and we've, we've had a break that um, has been forced upon us. Uh, and our return is going to be a little bit different in different states as governments ease restrictions uh, etc. But uh, in regard to the, the break of six or eight weeks, it felt like about three years, but um, Toby, are there more risks of injury as we come back from a break like that? Yeah, definitely. Like the six or eight weeks is a long time off. There's, there's going to be a lot of deconditioning. Uh, people haven't had access to uh, facilities to be able to operate either for basketball or general fitness and health. So they're coming back with a, a much lower fitness base. Uh, and, and people are then trying to jump straight back in at a level they were previously. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, it's been shown time and time again that that does increase the risk of, of injuries, particularly your soft tissue injuries, your calves, hamstrings, groins, uh, those sort of nasty little ones that cost you a few weeks at a time. Uh, and Ellie, you, you've had kids back at the school that are on holidays right now, but they, they came back uh, last term. How was their shape? Have they been active while they've been at home or have they been sitting around on the couch? Yeah, I think I think we were pretty fortunate. We could do a lot of stuff online, but as Toby said, it's not the usual movement and, and the exposure to act, exercise that kids normally do. Um, but we were fortunate to have quite a lot of internet time with the kids, um, but definitely coming back into school and, and back on the court, uh, they definitely were stiff and sore after their first couple of sessions, which was something that we had to manage. So, yeah. So uh, as a coach, Toby, can you just prepare your, your training plan like you, you would have before the break or do we need to do some different activities as we, we particularly with coaching kids at this stage? Yeah, I think uh, just needing to modify and, and potentially just easing kids back into it, giving them a chance to build back up. Uh, there's a, a potential risk of trying to play catch up, trying to fit in enough work to cover what was missed. Uh, and I think we've almost got to start from, from the baseline again, uh, work out where the kids are at and then, then gradually build up and start to gradually expose them to those uh, higher intensity loads and activities. I think, uh, like, based on our experience with that too, um, for the kids having this new reality and getting used to what sport looks like now, the connection piece is a really big thing. So, you know, we have a standardised warm-up, which is a lot of movement-based stuff, which we're getting their joints warmed up. It's winter, it's cold, we've got to get them ready to play. But, you know, we know for kids that can be a little bit boring at times. So we've had some games, we've had some ball handling and just ways to really make them feel a part of something while preparing their body to get back to the demands of sport has been something that we've found to be pretty beneficial. So, yeah, I think that's really important. You can make these things fun. They don't have to be really regimented uh, military style warm ups. It's all about <laughs> having a bit of fun and, and, and making sure the kids enjoy it. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's the focus areas, you know, around skill development and movement development. And they can all be done uh, with lots of fun games and, and things like that as well. So, yeah, that's, that, that is really good. So a game like keepings off, is that something that can be a good way to start a practice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, something that I think works really well is, you know, even something as simple as all the kids having a ball. I call it everybody's it, where kids can dribble around and tag each other and then they get a little, uh, their penalty for getting tagged is a little movement like a squat or a push up or, or something like that. So they're, they're still engaging with the balls. They're still doing some skill development, but they're including some, some fundamental movement patterning in there uh, and, and building just a bit of, you know, more normalised movement and, and a bit of strength and control. Um, so uh, there's all sorts of games and drills out there. I'm sure the coach has got more than I've got, um, but th- there are really good ways to just keep the kids engaged, but, but have them uh, incorporate some of that sort of functional movement stuff, which is pretty important. And Ellie, did you change the length of practices when they first came back at all? Uh, so 
we're quite fortunate at the moment. The group that I have is our more elite players. So we have a smaller group um, and we mainly work on individual skill development, which is kind of perfect for the type of training we can do at the moment. Um, we started around an hour, but we do about 40 minutes of skill and then we'd have our warm up, which was obviously dynamic. And then we do, you know, cool down a bit of conditioning. Um, I'm, I'm really big on core and hip strength and mobility and, you know, the kids sitting down and being in front of a screen for so long meant that, you know, everything was tight and they were sore. So that, the first couple of weeks of training, we really, probably the most important thing was that connection piece, making them feel like they belong to something again and, you know, preparing and then recovering their bodies after sessions. We, I mean, in terms of making shots, we're competitive. We want them to do well, but that wasn't the priority for the first couple of weeks back to training. Now, did you have to have lots of bags of ice and stuff on hand to help with that soreness? Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, what, what you mentioned with Toby before, I think this has been a great opportunity for people to reflect on practices and making sure you have things in place. So for us, having a standardised warm-up so the kids if they need to and there's not time to do it when they go to training at reps, they can do it outside. They know how to prepare their bodies and they know how to look after themselves. And similarly with recovery, you know, here's our video of you, what you guys need to do at home because you can't do it in the space that we have. you got to eat right, you got to stretch, you got to roll, you know, all the types of things that here's the resource. Because we can't do it with you now doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Um, it's been amazing and it's really good for the kids to have that sense of empowerment and, and figuring out probably a little bit earlier how important it is to have those good habits as we say as they come through um yeah it's been really good to see and it's good to be organized too i think as coaches and administrators we need to make sure that we have con continuity throughout programs and this has been a little bit of a blessing in disguise to make sure that you know from a basic level those types of things are covered and certainly from a club perspective, having a standard warm-up yeah. and then as kids move through the program and maybe they move from Division 2 up to Division 1 or they go up an age group, to have that connection too, well, I actually belong here because I know what we're doing at the start. can be really yeah. powerful. can really help them settle uh, into a new team. Uh, have yeah. you seen that? within? Because you've got a huge number of teams in the school. Uh, have you seen a benefit there of of being able to transition? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, definitely there's a lot of movement within teams and that's something that's highly encouraged because we want to reward improvement. But then if kids, you know, move up a team, it's not completely foreign because there is some familiarity. And then the other hand, you know, there's a leadership component with the kids feeling empowered because they know it and they're the ones that are running it. Um, you know, student-directed, learning and and that is so important so that's an easy win for any program to to implement those little things that really do make a big difference on on a multifaceted point of view yeah and it can take some pressure off the coaches too not having to be the expert on everything if you've oh. got some sort of standardized program or warm-up then you can sort of plan your sessions as opposed to having to continue to think about what you're going to do to warm up to make sure you've got all the, the components of a warm up and, and those sorts of things as well. So, um, and as I said, you know, the big thing for us is injury prevention. You know, it's been shown through a number of years that, you know, effective warm ups and appropriate warm ups do keep uh, keep people on the field and keep them out of uh, my rooms, which is. Uh, which is <laughs> and what about the other end of practice? Um, at club level, your practice finishes at 5.30. The next team's already re ready to, to walk on the court. Warm down doesn't always happen. It, it, should it? Like, it, is it? Should it be an emphasis? That's interesting. Yeah, I think it should be. I think, um, and, and certainly I think uh, potentially some of those fundamental movements and some of that sort of uh, strength development should be uh, included towards the end. There's been a, a bit of research out there as to the timing in the session when you do that sort of stuff and there's no benefit doing it at the start or at the end provided it, it gets done. Uh, and it's again, if it's, if it's driven by uh, staff or, or, or player leaders and that sort of thing, it can be done, uh, you know, in their own time. And I guess that it's another thing where we're giving uh, some responsibility and expectation around um, making sure that these things get done for the, the, the safety and the, um, the performance of the athletes themselves too. Uh, and Ellie, do you guys have a, a warm down 
that's standardised across the the club or is it up to each coach? So that was probably something that was missing for us in, in what we do. And again, that's why something like this is good to reflect because it was a gap. So we've always had our warm-up that's been standardised across the board. Um, now, you know, we've had opportunities to film, um, you know, coaches coach back-to-back -back within the school system. So it's hard for them to be with their team. So similar to what we'll do, we'll get the kids to know that they cool down and they'll lead it and then, you know, provide resources on, you know, I'm sure Tobes has a plethora of, of things um, just to make sure that they're recovering properly because, you know, people say they're young, they bounce back. But I mean, I, I was young and I didn't bounce back and I'm not playing anymore because of that. You know, if there's some stuff that I was empowered with when I was younger, maybe I would still be playing. So I think it's a, it's a big thing and the education piece is really big. So for my program, it's a gap and that's something I'm going to fix moving forward. And Toby, is, is it, as a generalisation, better to do sort of the, the dynamic stretch where you take the, the joint through a range of motion, so yeah, you lift the high knee up and put it down and that sort of stuff, rather than the old sit on the ground and hold a stretch for 20 mm -hmm. seconds? Yeah, absolutely. It's it sort of changed. It's almost gone full circle. Uh, probably back in the 60s and 70s, that was the way we warmed up. or uh, And then uh, that was deemed unsafe for whatever reason. And so we went to it. There was a lot more static stretching. Um, but all the recent ev evidence says that, yeah, much better off doing some muscle activation and getting those muscles firing and working working through the, the natural joints, joint range of motion, rather than the sit on the floor and stretch. There's even evidence now that for a sport like basketball involves a lot of jumping, running, power-based movements, that too much static stretching beforehand is actually uh, increases injury risk and is uh, compromising to performance. So it's actually more about um, getting those muscles working in the way that we want them to work during a game. And for the, the mum and dad coaches out there who are scared at the, the thought of dynamic versus static because they don't understand what that is, uh, are we simply talking about look at the movements that are in the sport and do them slowly at first and then sort of build up your intensity. You know? So include a little bit of jumping, include a little bit of walking, jogging, running. Is it that simple? Uh, and it's simplest form, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and look, there's been uh, a bit of research done in, in different sports now around uh, some of those those key movements. Uh, there are there's an amazing number of resources out there now um, to be able to find. Um, you know, I think I'm pretty sure Basketball Australia have got some on, on their website as well. Just a few different ideas. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's about and its simplest form is is preparing the the athlete for what they're about to do. So start with those movements, start with them slow, build up the speed and intensity until you're at a level that's near matching uh, the game or the training pace and intensity. One of the changes as we return to sport at a community level um, to be safe, uh, there's a lot more sanitising, hand sanitizer, balls being wiped. Um, so. We're having restrictions on the movement of people. Um, so one game has to clear out before the next two teams can come into the hall, that sort of stuff. Um, we're asking people not to come to the stadium half an hour before their game because they can't come in because we're keeping crowds small. In that context, how do we warm up for the game? Look, I think this is where it gets a bit bit challenging and this is, uh, you know, potentially some of the, the local athletes are going to find it more difficult. It becomes a responsibility to do it probably before you get there. So, you know, in, you, you're pretty well warmed up before you go into the stadium ready to go because um, obviously the risk is if you're not adequately adequately prepared for, for the game or the, the training session, your injury risk is, is going to be higher. So, uh, again, uh, I mean... Local uh, adults are notorious for not being prepared as, as best they could anyway. So I guess their, their risks are probably even higher than the, they would be normally. Warm-up is the walk from the car park to the court, isn't it? That's... <laughs> oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Via the canteen, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, so turning now to adults, and again, looking at the, the break that we've had, many people working from home, so they're not even getting the, the walking around that they might have had in an office, uh, generally. Uh, are our adult players and referees at, at a greater risk of injury than ever before? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, what they say now, sitting's the new smoking. Uh, sitting for too long is detrimental to lots of facets of our health. So, um, and, and what I've sort of seen in my clinic is that uh, even though people are working from home, they're probably less active than even working in an office at a computer. They find they get stuck for hours and hours at a time. Uh, so then, you know, if they're, they're losing conditioning, which it takes a matter of days to weeks before you lose conditioning, uh, if they go and try and uh, perform at the, the previous level, uh, they are at risk of injury. So I think for the, the adult level community athlete, it's about managing your expectations uh, and potentially uh, you know, having a few extra substitutions, things like that to uh, try and minimise uh, the, the high risk that it does present and then um, try and gradually get back into some, uh, some semblance of, of match conditioning. Uh, and I've got a smart watch that constantly prompts me to, yeah, maybe I should stand up and walk around. If I actually listen to it, could that help me on a Monday night when I go and play basketball if I've done a bit of walking around during the day? Uh, it, it'll definitely help. Um, as I said, the, the, you know, the, probably the, 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 the games you get just doing a little bit of walking um, probably aren't going to translate super well in, into the basketball. You'd be better off than if you didn't do it. Um, but in terms of a, a high speed, uh, rapid acceleration, deceleration sport like basketball, um, you know, you do need to uh, condition yourself ultimately for those sort of sports. And, uh, you know, um, if you've been playing it for years and years, uh, obviously that's, that's an advantage. Uh, but having that, that break still does present you with some challenges as you go back. What have the teachers been doing, Ellie? We, we've talked about the kids. Uh, is there a focus in your schools about making sure the teachers are, are getting active as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I'm very fortunate to work at a place that has a very holistic approach to wellbeing. Um, and we've had a number of resources with physical activity, mental health, everything like that. Um, you know, it, it definitely was difficult for everyone when the facilities were closed. But I think people, you know, if you want to do it, there are resources and tools out there to, to make things happen. Like I've never had a home gym my whole life before. And now, you know, I'm, I'm working out with bands and using all different things. Um, and, it, and it does make a difference. You know, the studies correlating mental health and exercise, it's, you can't deny it. So I think, you know, having a culture where, that's encouraged and promoted has been really big. So yeah, it's, it's, it has been good at school. And Ellie, you talked about the kids being a little bit sore than normal after sessions. Um, and the, the adults, when they play, they might feel a bit sore. Is there such a thing as a good soreness that you don't need to worry about? Um, when is soreness something you, you should address and, and how do you address it? This one's for Toby, right? As the professional. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, there's good soreness. So, um, you know, the first level of soreness we talk about is the delayed muscle soreness, which is that uh, muscle soreness we get within a few hours to 24 hours of, of playing a sport. It can last, you know, 48 to 72 hours, sometimes a little bit longer. Uh, generally, it, it improves over, over a number of days. Uh, the big worry is when it becomes really specific to a certain site or a certain area, or it continues to get worse as you, as you do some activity. Often, if it is just general soreness, if you the next day do some low intense exercise, like a little walk or a little jog or a bicycle ride or a swim, uh, and it improves, that's probably indicative that it is just muscle soreness and will settle in a, in a couple of days. If, as you do that activity, it's still a problem or gets worse, uh, then that's when you, you, you need to start thinking about uh, something else might be going on uh, and it might be worth getting it checked out a little bit further. And if I don't do any activity, is it going to get better by itself or? Uh, general soreness will, um, it's, uh, there's some evidence that doing a bit of activity actually helps alleviate that soreness a bit quicker. Um, okay. some people think, uh, you stretching, um, there, there's, there's not as strong as evidence as that as, as low intensity exercise. Um, some injuries, uh, have this, uh, way of fooling people that they stop exercising and feel better. And as soon as they exercise again, it comes back. Uh, and, and that's often a problem and those sort of injuries can tend to linger. Um, because the idea of doing nothing has been shown time and time again that it doesn't actually improve injuries as doing the right, I guess, loading and, and the right exercise and activity. I think that's really a big piece because when we were returning, we had, you know, the normal soreness and the kids felt like they were moving again. And then one of our athletes 
uh, went and played soccer and did movements that he hasn't done and probably didn't warm up properly and didn't do anything. And now he's got a pretty decent hip injury. So, you know, making sure that, you know, if you are a, a little bit sore, make sure you're doing movements that aren't completely foreign to you is probably something that's beneficial. Because, I mean, with everything being shortened and tight, and we are a bit more susceptible to, to tearing things. And so, yeah, but definitely while, you know, returning to sport and warming up and, and, and don't include handstands or fly kicks in your, in your warm-ups because it's a recipe for disaster. Not that this is what this kid did, but, yeah, it was just interesting. Yeah, and, and look, the body likes the same thing over and over again. Uh, our body loves to be... Um, yeah, same load, same intensity, and we get really comfortable with that. Uh, and it's when we start to challenge ourselves outside of that that, that things, the risk uh, goes up. Um, and we can, uh, to a certain degree, I guess, injury prove ourselves uh, with, with, with conditioning and, and our warm ups and our recoveries and things like that. Uh, but unfortunately, inherently, with, with any sort of sport, there is an element of, of injury risk that comes with it. And we need to work out the, the reward versus the risk of those and whether we, we want to take those on. Sure. And we talked about general soreness. For a basketballer, where would they you know, expect to, to perhaps feel some general soreness? Is it hammies? Is it arms? Uh, look, it can be anywhere. I'd say the most common spots for a basketball would be your quads, your thighs, uh, your hamstrings, and probably calves, the, 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 and, and maybe a little bit in, in, in your hips and butt, um, just because they're the major muscles for your explosive sprints and jumps and change direction and you know, the defensive slide and, and those sort of things that are, you know, the, the, uh, the really uh, high intensity movements in basketball. Um, so that would be the, the most likely. Uh, you know, for some of the kids, I'm sure if they're, they're getting up uh, hundreds and thousands of shots uh, per session, their arms and shoulders can get a little bit sore as well. So any of those moving muscles can be sore, but uh, I'd say mostly it'll be the legs of, of most of our athletes. And Ellie, you talked about a basketballer that did soccer as well. Do we need to be more aware as coaches of kids of the load that they might be carrying across a number of sports, given the, the break that we've had? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, it's, that's been a pivotal piece of the puzzle with coaches managing load and understanding, you know, multi-sport athletes. Um, and I think even from a really humanistic point of view, having conversations and understanding where kids are at and what they're doing, um, that's that's really important in itself. Um, I I don't believe anyone would be training kids to a level where it's high 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 competition at this point because it is a staggered return to sport. Um, but you, you don't know. Maybe sports are doing different things. So I think having conversations and and, and that is a big big piece of the puzzle. And that's where you know, it's different in every state. So Western Australia is back to full contact sports indoor and outdoor um victoria locked down for another six weeks so yeah it's quite different um and all sports as they can are all trying to start up at the same time so we mm. may end up having kids with more load whereas maybe they used to play footy in the winter and basketball in the the summer now they've got two seasons crossing over and they're trying to play both at the same time so yeah. that load management may be uh, more acute. Um, Toby, if I'm playing on Monday night and I do feel you know, a twinge in the hammy, I, well, that's that's not right. What do I do immediately? What do I do that night? Uh, look, the, um, the the most important thing, um, you know, ice is, is still a bit controversial, but um, ice does slow down some bleeding. So if you have got a little hamstring strain, I would probably ice it for, for 10 to 15 minutes um, every couple of hours that you're awake. Um, compression is really important. So a compression bandage or sleeve is really good. Um, getting a really good night's sleep is probably the most important thing. There was uh, people would wake up every couple of hours to ice through the night. And, um, you know, I, I would recommend get to bed, get to sleep. Um, 
I'd get it assessed nice and early to see um, how important it is. But I would, again, make sure you do go for little bits of walking um, because all the evidence says that the early mobilisation, the early movement, the early return of strength gets you back playing much quicker. So if you can get onto it uh, sooner, uh, you're more likely to have a smoother, um, better recovery because uh, things like hamstrings, I think the current injury re-injury rate is about 30%. So one in three people that do a hamstring will have a, another hamstring in the same season. Wow. And we see that even at the, the elite level with our footballers. Um, often, yeah, the, the yeah. troublesome hamstring, they come back, it goes again, they come back, it goes again. Yeah, happens very often. And again, as we age, uh, again, some of our older people on a, a social competition, um, their risks become higher uh, due to a, you know, a lot of factors related to, to getting a bit older, unfortunately. Can, should you expect more general soreness as you get older? Uh, yes, and it'll probably tend to last a bit longer. Uh, and, and certainly, um, and it's about that consistency. So particularly after a big break like this, um, you know, if you're an older athlete, and by older, I mean no disrespect to anyone, but anything over about 30, uh, you're probably going to experience a little bit more soreness coming back from a, a large gap, whether it's between seasons or, or with this COVID breakdown. So that's, uh, that's pretty normal. Okay, something to... Because I know in uh, a number of the associations that have come back, their biggest increase in registrations is at the master's level. Yep. Wow. Um, where yeah, the people are just desperate to, to, to get back into the sport. So across the board, where we're seeing in basketball, and I'm sure we're not the only sport, an actual increase in participation um, as people have really missed uh, the opportunity to, to be active. Um, but we need to make sure that it is, it is a safe one. Um, our sport involves a lot of change of direction and often quick, like you, you're reacting to something to change direction. It's not a, it's not a planned uh, movement. Uh, is that a movement that's more likely to, to cause an injury? Yes, and unfortunately, they're the ones that cause the serious injuries. So the uh, the knee injuries that uh, I think uh, Ellie's experienced a number of. So ACL injuries uh, are probably the, the big one. They tend to get a lot of the publicity because uh, if you do rupture your ACL, um, most people end up having surgery and it's, it's about a 12-month recovery. So that's 12 months out of sport. And that generally happens 80% are non-contact. So it's just somebody changing direction. Uh, their knee gives way. Um, the other one we see is uh, patella dislocations happen in a similar manner uh, and even uh, meniscus injuries and things like that. So uh, the knees tend to be the, the high profile and the most likely ones that happen with that. Um, and and we, we want to try and prevent those because they're, they're, they're costly to the individual, uh, but also to uh, you know, our health system and everything in general as well. Is there much prehab you can actually do uh, to avoid an injury like that or is it luck of the draw? Uh, no, there's, there's a, a whole lot of factors going to it, but there's a lot of evidence now that, that good, good prehab or, or a good, uh, good training in preparation is, is really important. Um, one of the big challenges that we've got at the moment is uh, you know, our overweight and obesity rates are increasing across the population. Uh, those sort of things put you at higher risk. Uh, deconditioning puts you at higher risk, which is that uh, six-week blocks uh, having time off. Um, you know, most sports now have developed. Uh, so I know uh, there's been a program around the PEP for years, the uh, FIFA 11. Uh, I think basketball have now got one, netball have got one, uh, AFL have got one, and these are all uh, prehabilitation warm-up programs that have, have shown to reduce the uh, the risk of, of serious knee injuries by uh, about 50%. Wow. That's a, a great thing that, that we're now seeing that. Has that been mostly at the elite level or is that something that's sort of cascading down to community coaches and, and players? Uh, it, it, it's starting to filter down now a lot more into a local level. Uh, the harder thing with the local level, again, is around the time and the implementation of them because some of them can be uh, time consuming and uh, the balance between the, the coaching, the skill development and the team tactics and, and, and getting those sort of things done is often a challenge and also the expertise of, of local level coaches but the aim of, of these is to, to be disseminated right from the, the kids when they first start uh, up into um, elite level athletes so ellie you've got 80 90 coaches involved in your programs uh, and they're presumably going to have a range of skills a range of experience that they they bring how do you, your school how do you educate your coaches on topics, whether it's 
this is our warm up protocol, this is our warm down protocol, whatever it is. How do you do that education when you've got so many coaches to talk to? Yeah, well, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate that the hub of our training is at the school. So before every, every session, we'll have a coaches meeting and we'll go through, you know, coach education, coach development and any things that have come up. Um, this, this year, I'm launching a, a website that's a coach education piece um, similar to the resources at, on the Basketball Australia Coach, just so, you know, video is such a powerful tool and we found that with the kids, that's how they understand things a lot easier. So, you know, just having that access for coaches. Um, so I meet meetings weekly and then having access to, to video and written content on a website um and you know being available to have conversations if if they you know if they need it and i think being approachable and willing to give up time and make someone feel a part of something and understood and and, and heard has been a big big thing so um managing a lot of coaches is difficult but i think if you have your systems in place and you you know create a couple of shortcuts for yourself with having templates then that does save you a lot of time in in the long run uh, and Toby, just a last question. If coaches do want more information about, you know, warm ups, warm downs, whatever it might be, do they just ask Mr. Google or are there some better places that uh, you could uh, get more reliable information? Um, look, there's, uh, there's some good information on. I, I would look stick to the, the, the major sites for, for your sport. So I know Basketball Australia have a uh, have a starting to build their database on, on those sort of things. Um, uh, approach the uh, uh, the key contacts at those organisational level, I think, is, is probably better than Dr Google. Uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of information on Dr Google that's a little bit outdated or, or, or um, not backed by appropriate levels of, of research. So I would start with your, um, your community uh, and your, your peak body, because uh, they'll be able to help disseminate the right information. Um, and often those, those websites will have some really useful links and handy tips. Um, and then, um, you know, contacting uh, key, key people um, that are around the, the environment. I think most sporting organisations now will have strength and conditioning coaches and physios and doctors that, uh, that, that are easy enough to access and, and get some advice from, um, rather than, um, yeah, some of the mis misinformation on Dr. Google. Great. Well, thank you both for joining me today on the podcast. And uh, you've got a lot of great information will help a, a very safe return to sport. Thanks again. All right, thank you.